Welcome everyone to MVM's top 10 games of 2019. We are in fact going to break norm and each of us is going to have our own list of 10 games instead of five for each. Well, that's yeah. 40 games, although there will probably be a Crossover. fair amount of overlap. There, there will be. And we don't, we have some idea of what some of our games are going to be. We have talked about it a little bit, but not completely. Right. And we certainly don't know what the order is that's coming up. So right. I'll be interested to see what kind of overlap we have and where we have it. Yeah. I'm going to start by asking each of the people as we start to explain these what your criteria was. Um, and then maybe explain a little bit why you picked that particular game. Kira, we'll start with you this year as your number 10 game. Tell us why you picked the games that you picked. So the overall list. Yeah. 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 Okay. So my overall list is mostly games that definitely have actually made it to my shelf in some way, shape, or form, or will very soon. I've played multiple times, and they hit on several pieces of criteria for me. So am I going to play it? Again and again, am I going to take it to my game groups? Is it easy to teach? Because that is a requirement for my game groups and, and so on. So it was actually really tough to make the list this year. I definitely could have gone with easily a 15 or 15 list. There, there was a bigger list. There was yeah. definitely a bigger list. So my number 10, uh, and this, this is one of those that I, it feels like it's going to be really obvious that I'm picking it because it's me, but uh, Tiny Epic Mechs. Because... And while it's not my favorite tiny epic of all time, it was it did something new. Mm -hmm. And I really like seeing what it did and what it brought. And that was the little mech suits and just adding these new components with it. They did item meeples previously, and the mech suits were a really nice addition to that. And uh, frankly, I really like what the game did from a, the programming perspective. I do like programming games. So that's my number 10. You love your tiny epic. It's a very different game than your tiny epic. Yeah, and I, I think yeah. that's it. it just did, there was a lot about it that was different from the rest of the series, and I really enjoyed it. Cool. You, All right, so before I get to my number 10, the way I looked at it is similar to how I've looked at it in the past. Um, things that are important to me, obviously the game has to be something I like to play. The amount of times I get it to the table also is a factor, although in the past there have been some games that we all love that just don't make it to the table for some reason, so I don't hold that against it too much. One big factor that I think was added to me uh, for me this year was uh, games that surprised me in that I liked them. In, in that they were in genres, okay. I mean, in that they were in genres that I traditionally don't find appealing. Mm -hmm. And there's been a couple, a few games this year like that. Uh, hopefully that's not too much of a spoiler alert. So with that said, uh, my number 10 is something that's fairly uh, similar to what you've seen on our list before, and that's Maracaibo. I've only had a chance to play this uh, a couple, couple times, one and a half times actually. One of those is a solo that I kind of fiddled through and realized I wasn't playing it correctly, but we played it all the mm -hmm. way through. It is an excellent game. Ryan had told us that he thought it was sort of uh, Fister's magnum opus, if you will, where it's kind of a culmination of a lot of the things he has in his games, and I, I do believe that's the case. It is a really, really good Euro, uh, and spoiler alert, probably one of the heaviest Euros on my top 10 list this year, for sure. Cool. Uh, so last year, my number one, I think the three of us had yeah. Betrayal at Legacy, or yeah. Legacy Betrayal. Yeah. Um, and I have to be cautious about how I give my number 10. And the reason why I'm saying this is because well, I haven't gone back and played Betrayal Legacy. And I feel like Legacy games, for me, have recently been one and done. Um, so I really wanted to make a list that I could see myself playing in 2020. Not just games that appealed to me and had that instant wow factor, but games that I knew I was going to, I was going to keep on my shelf and continually play. Now, I'm going to break that norm with this game here, but it's the last one that I'm going to break that with, and that's Clank Legacy. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite experiences of 2019. I loved playing that with you guys. Mm -hmm. Like It was such a good experience. However, I don't see myself going back to play with it. But the money that we invested in it and the time we invested in it was well worth it. Like, it's one of the best legacy experiences, if not the best that I've ever had, this period. Yeah. It's and that's so how good. you have to look at legacy. Like, yeah. if, if the game, even if it's one and done, yeah. if it was worth all the investment, that's, that's, you probably played it more than a lot of other non legacy games that time came out this year. I say one and done, but it was how many sessions? Right. Yeah. And right? the game can be played. Like, if you really want to go back and play it, you have a brand new Clank Legacy that's just for yours. I just don't know if I'm going to go back and play Clank. Sure. Many times after those 10 yeah. games that we initially played of it. So. Well, so I'll say I had a really hard time with my list this year, boiling it down to 10. A lot of games that I played earlier this year that I said, this game is going to be on my top 10 list, was actually a struggle to see whether or not they ended up there. So I, a lot of what you guys said already, like how often will I play it, how much enjoyment 
what kind of wow factor did it bring to me? Was it surprising? Because I had to call a lot of games off this list that were very, very good. This was a good year. I just ended up with games that I think I had a better experience playing. Mm -hmm. So my number 10 is uh, Taverns of Teeth and Tall, which is one that I thought was going to be much higher. But when I actually sat down to to lay it out, um, at least it's on the list. And this is a game by Wolfgang Warsh. So I think every year there's probably going to be a Wolfgang Warsh list. (laughs) Or three. (laughs) A game on the list. Um, I just love what Taverns does. And I love deck building games. And I love his games always have a satisfying combo feel. Mm -hmm. And you definitely have that with Taverns to the point where... I feel like I will. I don't even actually own it yet because I've been waiting for the North Hard Star, to get. and it's it's been sold out. So I will probably be playing that game well into 2020. Yeah, great game. Yeah. All right. So number nine for me. This one is interesting because again, I don't typically like these kind of games, and I was debating whether or not I want to put party style games on my list at all because they kind of are their own thing. But I did. I included Grim Masquerade because I don't typically like that style of game uh, with the with the social deduction mm-hmm. piece to it. There's only one other one that's really g- gotten me to bring it to the table more than once in that, and I've said it before, is uh, Don't Mess With Cthulhu. And this one, it does all the things I like uh, with, the, with Don't Mess With Cthulhu, mm-hmm. and then some, it's got a whole bunch of unique things and mechanisms to it that are just different for that kind of game, make it more of a game and a little bit less of the social deduction, like, in-your-face piece, I guess, so... That's number nine for me. Yeah, that's one I have to play again. I think we I only played it when we first got that copy, and I haven't gotten it. Yeah, I mean, it even has a two-player, which I was kind of surprised by. It didn't. Mm-hmm. I don't like the two-player as much. It definitely is more on the party game side for me where you want three or more. But, I mean, the fact was is that we were able to play it at two and, and actually have a decent experience. Yeah. So, yeah. My number nine is a game called Res Arcana. This is from mm-hmm. Sandcastle Games, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, this game came out, I don't know, mid-year-ish. Uh, and Maybe. we actually happened, Jeremy was nice enough to grab an expansion uh, of an early copy of an mm-hmm. expansion. I haven't had a chance to play that yet, but this game is sort of like the perfect weight that falls into sort of my typical wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. These, uh, it's a simple game to play with a lot of meaty decisions. It what, 45 hour? Maybe yeah, tops. Be, 45 it, hours it, would be a lot. If, 45 if that, to an hour? You mean 45 minutes? 45 to an hour. <laughs> okay. yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. If it's, um, it's quick. Little engine building game, really cool though. You start with this little hand of cards, and that's really all you have is a little tiny deck of cards. You're not adding cards to that throughout the game. You're just trying to cycle those and get them out into a tableau. And at the same time, it's a race to points. Um, but I'm really anxious to see what that expansion does. Uh, my number nine is Detective City of Angels. Uh, this is a game that we played a lot of when it first came out, and we haven't gone back to play it. However, uh, it really surprised me. I we had the opportunity to do the a Kickstarter pre. Preview for it back in 2017, maybe 18. Which we didn't. Which we didn't. Um, have, however, having go, gone back and played the game, I really, really enjoy it. It does something very different than typical board games. It puts you in the role of being either a detective or someone who's trying to throw off those detectives. And the way that it handles each of the cases is really unique. Uh, it's a really satisfying game to play, and it really does require the players to get into the minds of the cases and try to figure them out. And I really enjoy this game. I want to get more in depth into that, hopefully, here in the future. Yeah. All right. My nine uh, is The Magnificent. And this game just hits all the right notes for me. Um, it's by the same designers that did Santa Maria, which is mm-hmm. another game I really enjoyed. And I think this takes some of that and just ele- elevates it. I mean, it's got the, the, dra- the dice drafting, the tile placement, the tableau building. And, again, that combo factor that I'm looking for in games. You can use your workers to trigger cool need things and kind of manipulate the actions on the board uh, and you're, it's point salad you're getting points from all different directions plus i really like this theme of like putting on a traveling carnival and the artwork is all kind of very like dark and almost like, like art deco spook, like art de- yeah mm-hmm. you see the cover right back there too it's kind of almost like got a spookiness to it which it, it does <laughs> which i really like that too like it just all came together and it was very satisfying cool game Great game. Um, so for me, number eight is Quirky Circuit. So I love this game for so many reasons. And the primary one is that I've incorporated into my robotics program that I coach, uh, which is uh, third through sixth graders. And uh, while it's a fun game for us to play as gamers, it's got this mind vibe to it. It actually does a lot that allows me to teach the kids something. And 
and what that was what that brought to the table for me and being able to bring that to the club they have a lot of fun with it they're actually learning about teamwork and cooperation and programming all at the same time and it's just a really cool game i highly recommend it for all ages yeah, that's a really fun game, too. I mean, yeah. even aside from the educational aspect, yeah. it's just a lot of fun, that mind aspect. And the cool. production on it's very nice as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my number, what are we at? Eight. eight. Ooh. <laughs> my number eight. So this is one of those ones that falls into the category of I'm surprised that it's on my list. <laughs> and that is Cthulhu Death May Die. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like this game, we've recently played this. The first time we played it was on a live stream a few weeks for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've since played it a number of times with a number of different people. We've all enjoyed it. And the reason this is new for me is like, I've never really been into these sort of like thematic dice rolling games. This game in particular, um, similar to Nemesis, which wasn't a game this year, but another game in that sort of ilk that I liked, had a lot of things you can do, very streamlined experience too. And it didn't feel like total luck fest to me. Mm -hmm. Like the way the dice are used and the way it's mostly successful and balancing that with your madness going up and using that madness to power up your guys there's a lot of things in this game that are a lot of fun to enjoy that's i mean i that's on my honorable mention i didn't include that but i really like that game too mm -hmm. despite the fact that i hate dice rolling in games the idea of taking both a, a creature and then a scenario and mashing them up is just immensely fun plus it adds to the variability you could defeat Cthulhu with a very different scenario where I could defeat him and maybe with, against Hoster, and that's just a really fun thing to do. Yeah, and the, and the building up is probably the most exciting thing that I've seen everyone I've played with enjoy. You start and your character, you're rolling like three dice. Yeah. By the end of the game, you're rolling maybe eight dice, yeah. and just you feel so powerful when you're doing that. It's mm -hmm. still Things can still go badly, sure. but it just really gives you an immense feeling of power. Very cool experience. That's by uh, Rob Davio and Eric Lang, yeah. too, which... Yeah. Uh, a great, two, no slouches great there. there. Great no. theme, too. Uh, my number eight is Glenmore 2. Uh, Matthias Kramer is an excellent designer. Glenmore has been a game that's been around since, I believe, 2009, 2010. It's a very old game. I'm super happy that they reissued the game with a lot of changes, plus the modules that you add into it. You just increase um, the amount of variability within the game. There's something immensely satisfying about the game. Uh, it uses that rondel basically where the furthest player back will always take an action until they've caught up or passed some, another player. And then you're building like a tableau of your own basic Scottish landscape and then using that to combo different things. Immensely satisfying game. It looks fantastic too. Like they really did a great job with the production of the components in the game. It's just really, really cool. I agree. That was on my honorable mentions and it probably would have made it on my list. If I get into play more than the prototype, mm -hmm. I really want to sit down and actually play through the final game and try some of those modules. Yeah. All right, All right what are we at? Number eight, right? Eight. Number eight for me, um, we've already mentioned, is Clank Legacy. And I felt the same way you did playing Clank. I mean, it was just such a great experience overall. We had so much fun um, exploring that game. Where I differ a little bit is that I'm actually excited to play through that campaign again. And I actually have another group yeah. that's ready to play through because there are so many story paths you could take and we made very particular decisions in our game that led to very sp specific cards coming out mm -hmm. and i would love to see how much this game is going to change my second playthrough and how different our boards are going to look by the by the time it's done i mean this is a game that i, I think you can find infinite enjoyment out of i agree you can replay through that with a brand new copy of yeah, course yeah. but mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah i mean we were obviously uh throughout the game all three of us were contentious on how we wanted the game to proceed so there's a lot of story paths that you can go down. Oh, yeah. And that book is immensely thick, so it'd be cool. Yeah, so number seven for me was Clank Legacy because for several reasons. One, I'd never played Clank before, and I really, it was a, my first experience with Clank. Oh, I forgot that. Yeah, so I really like that. Um, what, I, I know, I played more like, I was more on the same wavelength with, with you, I think, when we were playing, whereas Ryan really wanted to tinker uh more cool. and so like i and i can see i have a game group like that so for me i'm actually disappointed we haven't broken out the finished and version of it and gone back because i know there's more to explore within what we already have done and i and that's why i wasn't too hmm. worried about finishing or going the route that you wanted to go because we were going to have opportunity to see some of that stuff down the road even after we finished the campaign element However, I would like to go through it again with a new group, and so I, I do plan. I do not currently have it on my shelf. It's one of the few on the list that is not, but that's because I do plan to add it and play it with my husband and our game group. So Cool. Yeah, I'm definitely going to get it. I haven't yeah. played it at all. So good. 
So I'm probably going to get a copy this holiday season and play it. My next one, this is number seven already, is Eco's First Continent. This is from AEG, designed by John C. Clair. This game came out at Gen Con, or at least in limited release at Gen Con. This is, again, one of my wheelhouse sorts of games because it's very simple to play. It's built around effectively a bingo mechanic where something is happening, everyone does something with their cards. You're also turning your cards and sort of aging them, which is a really cool mechanic. And you're doing all of that to create this continent in front of you, putting animals on there. You might have cards that have animals that eat my animals. I have cards that move my animals around in herds and you're scoring points all along the way. Really, really cool game and hugely open to uh, expansion. I, I hope they just continue to put more and more out for the game. I really like that you have that shared world yeah. that everyone is kind of building out of it. It makes the game feel almost like cooperative while at the same time very competitive. Yeah. Uh, my number seven is Lord of the Rings Jimmy or Journeys in Middle Earth. <laughs> You like my acronym? I've never heard of that acronym, Jimmy. So uh, this is it's very dis, uh, divisive what people think about this. Reviewers either love it or they hate it. I love the experience, and I'm quite surprised FFG hasn't put out more content on the way of expansions for the game. But uh, it presents you with one of the characters that you're going to be playing in the Lord of the Rings universe and going through multiple different scenarios. It's all app-driven, and I love the integration of the app. I feel like... Where Imperial uh, Assault suffers as a game is that the app was built after the fact. This was built in conjunction with the game, so they always knew it's going to be app-based. Um, and it's just really wonderfully done. Uh, the one thing I love, that I absolutely love about the game, is that it doesn't use dice. Like Everything you do is card-driven, so you're using your cards and specific combinations to take actions and to use the skills. Some people say it's just another form of dice, but to me it's not. It, it does the same thing that Gloomhaven does, where it allows you to be a little more um, in control of the actions that you get to take. And I love that part of the game. So uh, that's Journeys and Middle Earth or Jimmy. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> Hello, TR Jimmy. I was going to say, it definitely was one that was on my, was going to be on my list, but it got it kind of went off to my honorable mentions simply because we haven't played it anymore. And I don't know if that's because there hasn't been any new con I'm not sure yeah, why, but this is a game now. we would play together we all really yeah. loved, and I was certain it would get to the table more. And because it hasn't, that's the primary reason it didn't end up on my well, list. Well, it definitely ended up on my list because yeah. my number seven is Lord of the Rings. <laughs> the Middle Earth. Jimmy. 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 <laughs> and one of the reasons um, that you didn't mention that I love so much, you talked a little bit about manipulating that deck of cards. Yeah. And what's really cool about it is is the way you can level your character into different classes, and you can almost you gain experience. You can take cards from that class deck, put it into your deck, switch to a different class, keep that card, and then start leveling up with cards from That's a awesome. new deck. So you can create these combos, which is a word you'll hear me say a lot. You can create these cool combos in your deck of classes that maybe weren't designed to be multi-classed into, but you kind of have freedom to build your character how you like it. I think we all kind of very heavily specialized our characters into specific roles, mm -hmm. and it really helped us handle the challenges of the campaign. Not to mention the yeah. story just felt very, I like the very story. much like Lord of the Rings. Plus they changed up. The app had enough uh, unique storylines and unique things that happened in them. Like one time you're actually just going around trying to fight things. Sometimes you're trying to figure out like a mystery, almost like an unlock, who did this. So very interesting in how they handled the scenario. So six for me is Ishtar. I fell in love with this game. I was not really that excited about it at first. I saw the box, I was like, okay, cool. And then you're showing me area control and I'm like, we played that the week of Gen Con, right? Or yeah, like I think right so. before Gen Con. And I'm like not super big on area control stuff in general. And it's just not something that normally makes me get excited for a game. And it and then it started to evolve out on the table and it was like, oh, that's very pretty. And you, I think you guys were playing it. And then I got in to play it and I'm like, oh. And it, it kind of, we played it a few times. We had people over here at the studio. We played mm -hmm. it with them. And the more I played it, the more I thought about it. And then at BGG Con this year, I was like, I'm just getting oh, you it. Played it. Oh, yeah, I bought okay. it. I bought it and then I taught it to people. And then I taught it on Thanksgiving to my dad and my uh, husband. Oh, cool. And it is, it is now part of my regular rotation. That is why it ended up on my list, is that it's a game that stuck with me and that I thought about so much that I was, a lot of times games I play with you guys I don't always get because I'm only going to play them here sure. with yeah. you guys. This is not one of those games. It's a game that definitely had to have it, have it in my collection. And then 
I just really, I really like all the different tree art. There's this little blue tree that's really cool, and it's probably my favorite little tree in the game. But there, that is a minor part of why I like the game. It's just very, it's very variable, and it's entertaining, and it was very easy for me to teach. It's gorgeous mm -hmm. too. Yeah. So my next one is wingspan. I'm surprised I'm the first person to say this. <laughs> Spoiler: I'm guessing someone else is going to say wingspan today. Uh, I like this game for a number of reasons. When I saw this, in fact, I think we saw, this was announced right before the end of last year, right? Mm -hmm. uh, got the chance to see the rule book. I thought it looked really good. The nailed the production, the look of it. There's, and we love this in all of our games, a massive stack of completely different cards. Yep. And the cool thing, you're building an engine, you're, and if you haven't played Wingspan, I'm not sure why you, you're watching this channel, but... <laughs> Uh, you definitely should play Wingspan. You're building these engines on what, three different rows in front of you. The birds go into different categories. and also feels kind of like quasi-educational with all this information on the birds. Excellent, excellent mm -hmm. game. Now that I'm talking about it, I almost feel like it should be higher on my list, but <laughs> that's my number six or uh, seven. My six. number six I really thought was going to be my number one earlier in the year. It's Watergate from Capstone. I absolutely love this game. It's probably one of my top three most played games this year um we have said just about everything we could possibly say about it either on chit chat or reviews or making an mvm approved title like it is such a good two-player game i highly suggest it to anybody who likes board games even if you don't like that era even if you're not into history the gameplay is super solid it's super thinky the more you play it the more you start to figure out each of the different sides it's just a wonderful, wonderful game. And it's only like 30 or 40 bucks. So it's super cheap for mm -hmm. a two-player game. So uh, that's Watergate. My number six is Marco Polo 2 in the service of the con. This was a mm -hmm. game that I was very excited about. I'm actually surprised, again, that it didn't end up a little higher on my list. It might as I play it more. I've only played it twice. But what this game does to Marco Polo, like taking everything I loved about Marco Polo and making it better while also fixing some of the issues I had with the game, um, it's just a fun game to play. I mean, I, I, Marco Polo is one of my favorite games of all time. And this might end up being higher over time as I kind of explore more options. Um, the one thing that kind of didn't feel as satisfying were the, the characters that you play Marco Polo 2 don't feel as broken. Which, maybe that's a good thing for the game, but I did like feeling like I was completely breaking parts of the game oh, sure. in the first Marco Polo. But besides that, um, yeah, it's just a really fun thinky Euro game that does everything Marco Polo did, but better. I agree. I uh, Marco Polo is my least favorite from the Italian designers. Actually, I just called it last week because I have Marco Polo too. Yeah. I think it's a far better game. Um, I like the fact that they didn't dumb down the characters, but I do feel the characters in the original game, especially in a two-player game, can be really lopsided. Plus, some of the market aspects are really lopsided as well in the um, original game. Mm -hmm. So I really like Marco Polo too as well. Great game. Right on. My number five is Flick of Faith. So uh, this is a Crokinole-like game. Uh, Dexterity Games and Crokinole in my house are have to get to the table when that showed up here. it was. I just fell in love with it instantly from the art alone. I wanted to play it. And then when I realized it was a Crokinole with gamery elements added on top of it, it just, there's nothing wrong with the game. Everything oh, yeah, about it fun. is great. I think uh, like somebody tried to I taught it to some friends at just this past weekend and they were like, I'd like it if the mat was bigger. I'm like, no, the mat doesn't need to be bigger. It's perfectly sized. And it's, yes, you have to get used to the fact that because your head wants to say crokinole and so the discs aren't the right size or whatever. Yeah. And you can always pick things, but at the end of the day, the game is perfect and it is a lot of fun to play and uh, it's beautiful to look at, so. Yeah, we do that with a lot of games. It's easy for us to play a game and go, oh, this would be cool if they had done this or this. But like you said, that one's yeah, nothing very needs to good, change. right as it is. Yep. All right, my number five is Hadara. This one is from Z-Man. This, as soon as I played this this year, I knew it was likely going to be in my top 10. This is, again, perfectly in my wheelhouse. Very simple game to play. A lot of really interesting and meaty decisions. It also uh, builds significantly. I love a game where you kind of start out slow and you're doing this and that, but by the end of the game, you have a lot of power built up and there's these four tracks that you do that on. Just an excellent game. And in a very abstract way, recreates sort of the civilization style game like a Seven Wonders. And it's also very, very pretty to look at. And yeah, we just played the expansion uh, 
last week, my wife and I. So good. Like big expansion or little? They're one? small, little. They're not even in boxes. They just came in little oh. bags. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah. they're cards that you're gonna add. We'll, we'll to, I'll teach yeah, you yeah, to yeah, you because yeah. it's super good. Uh, my number five is my second Capstone game. This one is Maracaibo, uh, which I think is probably the best Alexander Fister game. Maybe Great Western Trail may be better because it's simpler to teach. It's faster game to play. However, there's a lot of things in Maracaibo to love. I'm not going to go through how to play the game or all the different things about it. Yeah, you um, tell how to play the game. There's, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff going on in the game, but it does take from a lot of the different things that he's done as a designer and puts them into one game, plus the legacy aspect of it, which is it's not a legacy game, but it adds enough new things between games and it makes you want to keep playing and go through yeah. your story cards because it interjects new islands, new things you have to avoid or want to accomplish through the game. So it gives you a carrot or a reason why you want to keep playing the game over and over and that's really cool like that could be a part of a lot of different games by not making it legacy but giving you new introductions to the game well and i what i liked about it was that we played with andrew and then he, we played with david and it didn't matter that whoever yeah, we were no. playing with changed i out. jumped yeah. in and you guys you were on the second or third stage of the story yeah it made no difference whatsoever to me i was able to enjoy the game because that was the game i learned yeah. and i still understood the game enough to know how to play it from the very beginning as well there's just all these different pieces that go out and i agree i think this is going to tr be a trend we see significantly where people put that in there uh, that you can play through that sort of campaign. It gives you a different experience every time, and it is a huge carrot. Yeah. Like when you finish a game, and a game like Maracaibo is not typically the kind of game you finish and go, let's play it again. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and I'm not sure it is, it is even now, but it is one of those things where you're like, oh man, we just uncovered this. I'm really interested to see how that let's impacts our next, next game. Again, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. Number five, right? We're at number five. <laughs> My number five is another capstone game. This one is Crystal Palace. And this is Fearland developed this one who they've developed a lot of my favorite games. I really enjoy Crystal Palace. This is a dice placement game where you don't have to roll the dice. You get to set the dice to whatever pit value you want and then pay the amount of money that you're showing. In a game that has a very, very tight resource economy. So it's very interesting the way you have to look at this because you can do anything you want with those dice as long as you're willing to pay for it, which means you have to address the you know every possibility of what other people are going to do with their dice because there's a lot of blocking, uh, there's a lot of racing to get like inventions and inventors first. Uh, so I I honestly really love this game. I think the only reason it wasn't higher on my list, it it's not super variable. Um, the order that certain things come out is variable, but like the actual boards are going to stay the same. So we'll see after I play it more times, it might actually end up going up on my list. So cool. All right. So number four for me is D. Tavernon Tiefenthal. Only because I figured out how to say it, I think I'm saying it right. <laughs> and I have to still say it the German you're, way. You're saying the German way. The German yeah. way. Yeah. Well, that's why, how I got to know it. So now I actually did, unlike Ryan, go and pick it up at PAX Unplugged. Because it was there. <laughs> yeah, I, oh, you didn't pick one up? There. I flew. I didn't really have a lot of space to bring oh, a lot of stuff. Oh, I see, I There's see. There's always space for games. I've made space <laughs> for games. I went prepared knowing I was like, they. I ha it sold out online. I'm hoping they're going to have it at the show. And I got it. And I'm glad I waited to get the English edition for a number of reasons. But one, because Man vs. Meeple Approved is on the cover. Yeah. And that was exciting. Um, and also because my husband, he likes craft beer. And he and the I, the theme of the game was one. I'm like, ooh, am I going to get him to play this kind of game with me? Because there's beer involved. Because there's beer and the theme is cool. And so uh, it did. It actually has made it to the table a few times now since I picked it up at Pax and Plug. Not just with him, but I also taught Andrew uh, over the weekend. So, cool. Cool. yeah. So my number four is Ishtar. We've mm. already talked about it a little bit, but a couple more things I'll say. This game has some layers to it that you wouldn't expect when you first play it. You sit down and you play it, it's very pretty, so it looks like kind of a light game, but when you start playing it, it's very strategic. It's got an abstract nature to it for sure, but then I don't think you touched on this when you talked about it, the player board has all these options of climbing up mm -hmm. these things, sort of almost like leveling up in different ways, giving you different powers effectively giving each player the option to have a little bit of a variable aspect to how they're approaching the game and how they're scoring their points at the end. And you might have to change that depending on what's happening on the board for sure, which makes every game you play very, very different. Well, you know why I didn't talk about the skills? Because I build trees. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. The first game we played, that's all she did was just 
I have tree, since tree, decided tree. to start doing the skill that lets you get points for trees around your guy because it seems like a worthwhile thing. But I think that I don't go real heavy on the skills. I'm a when sucker I play. for leveling up anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like put that in front of me in a game and like, oh, I want to go up here. Did you win? No, but look at this. <laughs> but that's the cool thing about the game is that we play it two completely different ways. Yeah. And it's still super fun. Yeah. Uh, my number four is also Crystal Palace. Uh, the moment we played this at Gen Con, I knew it was going to be super high on my list. I love worker placement games. I love dice games. I love dice games where you don't have to roll the dice. You just pick whatever side. You already mentioned that, but there's also uh, numerous layers in Crystal Palace that you don't really realize the first time you play, especially um, when to hold back, when to go into debt. Uh, we've said this before on a previous stream, but there, you can intentionally go in debt, and it's going to hurt you in some facets, but also give you the economy to be able to do things. And you've proven that you can win that route, mm -hmm. which I never thought was possible, and it opened my eyes up to the different possibilities that you can play within the game. It, plus, it's beautiful to look at. It's a really gorgeous game. It's super euro which is right down my alley. Uh, it's probably the best pure Euro game I've played in 2019. Wow. Yeah. So my four is also Maracaibo, which we've, we we're seeing that, yeah, we're seeing that one on this list a lot. Um, for me, I actually like it better than Great Western Trail. I think, it, like you mentioned earlier, I think this is a lot of the, the thoughts of Great Western Trail, but streamlined into this rondel um, and the way you can like leave uh, assistance out on the board. As you pass by this rondel, you can trigger new abilities. Each round, you'll be getting new options. And just the amount of decisions you have to make in Maracaibo. Everything is a decision. How far you move your boat. Do you want to push toward the end or do you want to hold back? Do you want to stop and take village actions? Do you want to use your multi-use cards to deliver? Or do you want to hire them as, as projects out on your board? Um, do you want to push for different reputations? Like there are just so many things to do in that game. It's kind of overwhelming at first, which is why it's a big teach. But after you play a round or two, it just clicks. And then it's just a very satisfying experience. Something about both of those games that Fister is really good at, even with uh, Expedition and Dewdale, which is a you know a game that also came out this year, is he's really good at that instant gratification. Like the moment you do something, you buy a card, you get something from it. You go to a location, put an assistant, you get something from it. You're always getting rewards for every single move that you take within the game. Even in Great Western Trail, it's the same way. Yeah, you there really spot, isn't a dead something. move in that no, game. No, there's nothing that's wasted in the game, which yeah, is fantastic. Yeah, and like Great Western Trail, there's a player board full of upgrades that you can choose. Like in Great Western Trail, you can upgrade your movement speed, you can upgrade your oh, certificates. Yeah. You can, a lot of that is present here as Maracaibo as well. And yeah. you're not gonna be able to get every upgrade. So you're kind of choosing how to build your player board. Yeah. On to three. <laughs> this is funny because I wanted nothing to do with this game. You were super hot on it when it was announced. Oh, and I, I know what it is now. I kept going, who cares about this game? I liked it so much, I bought a second copy to make a shadow box of it for my new office. It's Wingspan. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted nothing to do with the game. I was like, oh, it sounds dumb. Uh, and it's one of my favorite games, one of my most played games of the year. It would be, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't put it as high as I have, so. Cool. What about you? No more about Wingspan. That's it. <laughs> I think we've talked about it already. Right. And good. we are have starting to get some overlap here. Yeah. My next one is Taverns of Teef and Tall. Mm -hmm. I went with the English language. Uh, <laughs> translation uh we've said a lot about this already one of the things i've said before and i'll say it again here if you liked uh quacks of quidlinburg and you liked other wolfgang wars games like um Ganshun cleaver i do think there for me anyway there is some dna from both of those present in this game that push your luck of, of flipping out cards um not so much push your luck but as opposed to pulling things out of a bag mixed with the dice placement and the dice drafting that you feel from mm -hmm. Gons is definitely here. And it's in a much meatier sort of Euro experience. Yeah. Uh, my number three is Tainted Grail. And I admit that I haven't played enough of it, but I've played enough to know that it's on my top three. It's, <laughs> um, well, number one, it's got probably the best components of 2019. Uh, number two, I have played enough to know that the story is extremely well written. I love the concept of going through a large campaign I love that the cards flip over and you have art on every single one of the cards. So it's super thematic. When you go to a location, you're going to see what that location is. And it's going to have a guide that's going to walk you through your decision points. I love that it's card-based. All the combat in the game, all the dialogue is card-based. As you're meeting people, you're doing dialogue trees. As you're, doing, as you're doing combat, you're doing combat trees. And you're using a deck of cards that you're constantly building up. It's just really, really well done. So... Going into 2020, this is probably the game I'm going to concentrate to get through. 
whether it's with you guys or by myself, because I cannot wait to go through all the stories. I'm tired of waiting. Yeah. Well, I've, I've, even, <laughs> I've only played that game once, and it was for like an hour and a half. And even in that little bit of time, I was like, man, this might end up on my top ten list. Because even that was enough for me to know, like, everything in that game just felt so good. Yeah, I'm really excited to play through. I'd love to play through I can't wait thing. to dig in. Yeah. yeah. All right. So number three for me is Watergate, which we've mentioned already. Um, the reason it was so high for me, uh, this is probably my most played game this year. I have another friend who equally loves this game. And since we have played it so many times, and I always play as the editor, and he always plays as Nixon. Always? Always. Well, this is just how we play the game. Which makes it very interesting because we're at a point now where we have played so much that the game has evolved. We know like to wait for certain strategies. I, I'm expecting certain cards to come out. Like You see different combinations in your hand that you know. I can do these mm -hmm. methods. But yet, because of the way the evidence tokens come out, because of the way that the cards, the order that they come out, every game we've played has been vastly different. And he's won a lot as Nixon. I've won a lot as the editor. I've won different methods. Uh, it's just been interesting to see this game. Like, we've played, I, I'm not kidding, probably 16, 17 times, the, just the two of us. Yeah. Aren't and, you interested? Like, I'd be so curious to switch sides if well, I I've, were you I've guys. played as Nixon. In a, I mean, I've played as Nixon a lot. But I've, even just the two of you, I'd be interested to watch that experience. It might be something fun to do, but we've, just, <laughs> we've enjoyed playing these roles. <laughs> Right. And it's just become kind of familiar. It's just it's a lot of fun to play the game that way, I think. Yep. I say my top four games were no question. I knew exactly which ones they were. So number two for me is Watergate. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of reasons why. One, it's one of my most played games of the year as well. Uh, it's a game that, again, when I first saw the box cover, I was like, okay, uh, do we need that game? <laughs> what is it going to be? And then it came out and we played it at, what was that? We were yeah, at Origins? Origins? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We stole Clay's copy and we played it and we taught it to a bunch of people and we loved that taught game. Everybody. We taught oh, it to yeah. everybody. We, like, Huge that, advocates. That, that copy got gross really fast. No, uh, but the, cause just, it probably it, did. It, it, we, we burned through it. We hadn't sleeved it or anything. So, um, and, and the other thing is my husband doesn't like mean games and I tend to like mean games and I get to be mean in this game and he likes it. And I taught it to my dad and there's the whole history piece. Like yeah. the last thing yeah. I'll say is the way that the game has been done and the rule book and the way that you can go and look up the different cards and then not only learn about what the card's ability is, but also see the history behind it in more detail than what you're getting from the card. The, the theme is really, really strong in this game and it plays to the gameplay very well. And I just, it's a great game. I mean, I don't yeah. think we talk about it enough, frankly. Yeah, it's a great two player game. Uh, spoiler alert, it's not on my list, but it's definitely honorable yeah. mention for me. Uh, I've played that a number of times, not quite as much as you guys. <laughs> Uh, my number two is a game I didn't think I'd like. Uh, Jeremy definitely didn't think I would like, and that's Marvel Champions. Um, this is not the kind of game that I've typically paid, played in the past. I think I owe it completely to the IP that's attached to this game that mm -hmm. got me into it. Um, I also like the fact that it's cooperative. Uh, I mean, a lot of these types of games are oftentimes competitive, and I don't like getting into that, particularly with people who are experienced like yourself because I just get destroyed. Mm -hmm. But this cooperative Marvel based game where you're really savoring the theme in these cards, like as it's probably one of the most thematic experiences I've had this year. And there's been a lot of thematic experiences, but when you're playing those cards at just the right time and you can almost imagine it playing out in the comic book or on a movie, so, so much fun. And it's super hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I could not not put, Wingspan is my number two. Uh, it is a phenomenon. It deserves all the praise that Elizabeth has gotten from designing the game, all the work that Jamie's put into it from Stone Meyer to get the game produced in just an absolute glorious fashion. It's my most played game of 2019 by far. How many times do you uh, think? Prob um, probably 40 to 50 times. Yeah, really. um, <laughs> Sarah and I play it all the time. It's constantly variable. You may have games that you just blow up the board. There's times when you just can't get the right combination. That's the joy of it for me. You're not always going to be successful, but it's fun playing it every single time. I love Wingspan, and I, it can be expanded to the heavens, and I will get every single expansion for it and enjoy it. And I think that this is a game that should be an evergreen. I think yeah. everyone who likes yep. board games or you want to introduce people to, to board games that just are against it, teach them Wingspan. Because I think mm -hmm. that's the lure that you need. It's the perfect game for that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Wingspan was so close to being on my list. But see, I haven't played it nearly as much as you guys have. And Wingspan is another one that, like, 
the more you play it, just the better it gets. And I've Absolutely. played it maybe only five times, but every game experience feels better. I think if I played it ten times, it might be a lot higher. Well, we just yeah. played it with the new expansion, and that was, I mean, that was a lot of fun. We that was. focused on only playing with mostly the new expansion stuff, and it was it was a lot of fun. We, we, we started coming up with other themes mm-hmm. or other expansions during the live stream oh, really? yeah so oh, like yeah. what other so there's like the south american expansion or the arctic expansions and things like that but i want a dragon wingspan i just want oh, dragons the engine itself mm-hmm. could be applied yes. to so many different dragon yeah. wingspan <laughs> jamie get on it all right so number two. number two for me is a game i'm surprised nobody else mentioned so far but it's paladins of the west kingdom this game just hit every right button for me Everything comes together in this game in a very satisfying way. And this is the second in the second game in the second series from Shem. He did the Raiders of the North Sea series. And then now the, the Architects of the West Kingdom, Paladins of the West Kingdom. I like Paladins the best out of all of these games so far. It's the Just, heaviest, right? It is, it is the heaviest, which might speak to that. But there are so many paths you can take in this game. So many strategies that lead to victory. And what's really cool about it is each Paladin in your deck of Paladins is built to help you move down one of those paths to victory. And so the order in which you're drawing these paladins, and you get a little bit of choice as to which paladin you want to play each turn, but that order determines if you're going to be your strategy and how strong that strategy is early in the game Hmm. or later in the game. And you have to plan your strategy around these paladins so you can't just play the same strategy every time you play. And that makes this game uh, infinitely playable to me. Like I, I don't think I'd ever say no to paladins. What about right now? Yeah, let's go. Play it. All right. Right <laughs> after this. <laughs> All right. So we are now at our number ones. Kira, I want you to start us off. I think I already know what yours is, mine is, and Ryan. So Should we just <laughs> lead, all lead say it at path? the same time? We <laughs> probably should, but it'd be weird for the lower thirds that we have on. <laughs> yeah. What is it? Cool. It's Marvel Champions, obviously. I am an Arkham Horror player, so I play that almost weekly with uh, some local friends. And uh, so I, I like the L- LCG element. Most of the mm-hmm. ones I've played have been cooperative. And so uh, what this does for me that, it, that Arkham doesn't is it is the theme at the end of the day. And it is that it is tighter and the most it's done so elegantly. And they've taken all the things that we really like from previous LCGs, from my understanding, at least from Arkham. Like one of the things is getting rid of the, the instant fails for me was, was a big win. And the theme of the game, and I, yeah, I'm obviously just super attached to Captain Marvel, uh, uh, just because she's awesome. She's so awesome. I can't wait to play with all the new characters because I only have the core set right now. But absolutely, it hits my table more than anything else right now. So it is my the favorite. way the characters play is probably one of the coolest yep. things to me when you play with a different character and how so, how different some of them can feel. Is absolutely. Cool. But I'm not going to talk about Marvel Champions because I already did. I'll be the oddball uh, on our number ones here. And this game, when I played this, is a co-op game. It's one that I knew was going to be in my top 10 when I played it. I didn't know that it was going to be my number one. And I'll tell you why. And it's horrified just to get that out there. This is a fairly simplistic game for our sort of level of gaming. Mm -hmm. But I've played horrified at least as much, if not more than just about any other game I've played this year, which is amazing because... I've played it with so many different groups. Everyone's dug it. I've even just facilitated it and taught the game and let everyone else play at the table. And I don't remember an experience where everyone didn't have a lot of fun. We're getting people playing who aren't even that into board games. And they're really getting in to try to figure out and solve that puzzle together. And in all of those cases, I also don't think I ever saw a huge alpha gamer issue in all of my plays. I mean, there's always going to be someone who says, oh, maybe you do this. But everyone... The game is understandable enough to where everyone can participate on uh, at least a certain level. There's no one who's like, I don't know what I should do. Uh, There are some character roles that make it wildly variable. So you really have to kind of settle into those. I hope, hope, hope they expand it with more monsters. I don't know that they're going to. But the game is uh, really, really has a huge opportunity for those expansions. So Horrified is my number one for 2019. Uh, my number one is Marvel Champions. It's not even close. Like, if all the other games on my list were to disappear, I would be fine, and I could play Marvel Champions until I die. And I think that's what's going to happen here. Like, this has a long lifespan to it. Mm-hmm. It's de- uh, developed by Nate French and Caleb Grace, who are two of the designers of Lord of the Rings, and I absolutely love those games. That's had almost a 10-year span now that that game has been out. 
uh, being that it's the Marvel license, it's going to have a huge amount of content, not only with all the characters that we love, but it's going to have all the villains we love. It's going to have campaign boxes, which they've already kind of announced, so I'm not spoiling anything. I mean, I'm so invested in this game that I'm making art boxes. I'm sleeving all of my heroes in different colored sleeves. Uh, these things, which are awesome. If you guys like um, organizers, I actually reached out to Broken Token and said, hey, I have, it's going to be number one on my list. And they created a insert for it. And then I have an art case that has its own insert for it. So all these things just speak to my just love of this game. It's incredibly satisfying to play. It's super fun to play with multiple players or, or by yourself. Yeah, It scales perfectly. All the villains are a puzzle that you have to figure out, and they're all super thematic. All the heroes are super thematic. It's beautiful. Like It's just a gorgeous-looking game. It's Marvel. Um, and I love the LCG model. I'm in my mid-40s, and like you, I've grown up playing Magic and all these mm -hmm. other games. And as you start to get older, it's really hard to find groups and find time and the money to invest in that when you have a mortgage and all these other things. The LCG model is perfect for this because it allows you to buy what you want to buy. You can buy as much as it you want if you really want to you know, build a lot of decks, or you can just buy one of each. It's up to you. Or you can just buy the core set and have fun with that. The core set, the core set has, has a lot of game in it. Yeah. There is a lot of game in that core set. I mean, I've played, I mean, this might be my lack of experience, but I lost a lot in Marvel mm -hmm. Champions. Mm -hmm. So it's taken me a while to get past, you know, a few games to just get past Rhino. And then you've got those different difficulty levels yeah. on each of them. And like you said, all the expansions, in fact, by the t when while we're filming this, I think this week, right, is yeah. when all the new, all the new stuff yep. comes yeah. out, Captain America and Green Goblin and Miss Marvel. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so well, I'm super excited too. And to your point, like, one of the things about Arkham that was frustrating for me when I got it was I had to buy two core sets. You don't have to buy two core sets for Marvel. I did because I know me and how I like to deck build for these type of games. But honestly, it, anybody can pick up the core box yeah. and have everything they need, which makes it incredibly accessible. Yeah. yeah. I'm a giant advocate of this game. If you guys are at all interested in uh, those type of cooperative games uh, and you love Marvel, this is an absolute mm -hmm. no-brainer. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Ryan. So, well, my number one is Marvel Champions. Yeah. And I actually debated putting this on my list because I knew you guys were going to put it as one, but at the end of the day, it is the best gaming experience I've had all year. And we we just sit around when we're not playing, we're talking about it, and we're talking about new characters that could come out, new ideas and mechanics. And at the end of the day, this is the closest feeling I've had to being a kid pulling out your superheroes out of your toy box and playing That's with exactly them. Because, That's a good point. Because every one of these characters, um, and for those who don't know, they have you know, your alter ego side, you have your Peter Parker side, and you flip over and you have your Spider-Man side. And flipping back and forth is actually a key component to the game. It's huge. And some characters want to be alter egos more, some characters want to be superheroes more, and it's just fun to figure out how these characters work, and my mind is just reeling at all of the possible heroes we could come out with. And that's how you know you love a game, is when you're so invested that you have lists of characters and villains you want to see. And I know what these designers did with Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. I saw, even though I didn't play the game, I saw just the hype when some of these, like the Black Riders came out and just some of these cool moments that changed that game. Maybe I'm setting my expectations too high, but I'm expecting that same sort of treatment with Marvel. I, I know there's going to be a point that a new something comes out and we're just going to be just mind blown. Well, well we've already seen it with the four villains that are out. Like. Well, I'm not sure true. you guys have played. I think you two have played Green Goblin. I'm not sure you have. Yeah. No, the four, no, I haven't. So the <laughs> four, so the four villains, even now, just with four, they're vastly different. Yeah, well, all the Wrecking the Crew sounds crazy too. Different. I'm excited for it. It's coming crew. out. I mean, the mechanics they're uh, injecting in this, where it just feels like a completely different experience, like yeah. you're saying, is super, super. Yeah, cool. the design space is huge. So that is our top ten of 2019. Make sure you make comments below to let us know what we missed, uh, what we got right, what's on your top ten. Stay tuned because we're going to have our top 10 most anticipated of 2020 coming up soon as well. Subscribe to us, follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook and Instagram and everything else we do. Being that this is the holidays, happy holidays to all of you. Merry Christmas to you guys who celebrate. And for those of you who don't, have a great time with your family and we will see you guys next time. Bye-bye.